what have what have what have we done why is there such an overkill in the vodafone case amendment we showed the court on a global basis this is not the first time where indirect transfers have created problems of taxation countries have dealt with this for almost two decades with the increase in global investment everybody has calibrated either you calibrate your tax treaty to deal with companies which have sub assets in downstreams or you calibrate your law to specifically tax in france in italy in germany they have specific legislation which says if your company downstream company has more than a prescribed defined percentage of real estate it will be taxed but if you have a downstream company owning shares in industrial investment it will not be taxed in certain tax australia had this problem with its mining assets so it made a general law saying in all the tax treaties if there is a downstream company they will be taxed all this was always always prospective it applied to investments made thereafter we had the models before us we could have changed our law and said downstream will be taxed we had to be specific we had to be categorical each law specifies exactly a the nature of the downstream asset b the exact percentage which kicks off the taxation and those laws have remained stagnant for years so what have we done we have gone and amended the law wholesale we have gone and amended the definition of property to include all rights in management we put it at odds with the company law we put it at odds with the law of contract you not amended any of those laws so you now have two parallel definitions and it's it's ironical to tell a foreign investor as of now there is a wrong judgment of supreme court which holds the field which says shareholders agreement cannot be enforced so you tell a foreign investor this unenforceable agreement is property what sort of a mixed message idiotic message are you giving that you are in such a hurry to impose this tax that you don't even take a global look at your own laws and rationalize them so you tell a foreign investor if you sign a shareholders agreement you are not guaranteed voting rights but what you are guaranteed is that you will be taxed in india you come with gar vague defined provisions with a remarkable reputation our tax department has for fairness what is the message you are giving you come with section 97 for treaty shopping why the circular you issued saying tax residency certificates of mauritius will not be gone behind continues you renegotiated the mauritius treaty you made changes to the uae treaty you made changes to the singapore treaty you did not make changes to the mauritius treaty i was the solicitor general of india who was instructed by the government of india to argue and finally we argued successfully in the supreme court that our mauritius treaty was deliberately designed to give mauritius an advantage because of the large indian diaspora but more importantly because of the strategic relationship with mauritius as a country in the pacific rim why do you sign treaties like this and then enact sections like section 97 most countries carefully calibrate treaties so that a man reading the treaty knows what he can and what he cannot do but in india everything now seems to be we leave it to our tax department to decide we have two parallel regimes here is our treaty which we declare to the world here is a law which we declare to the world but don't take any of this seriously your fate will be what the income tax will want it to be is that the message we are giving to the people of the world and to add insult to this injury all these changes are captioned by for removal of doubts i see a very strange uh, irony i'm sure if somebody was to word check which is the most commonly occurring expression in the amendments i think the expression for removal of doubts will show up we have removed so many doubts so everything which the court say is a matter of doubt 
including the Supreme Court. What the department says is undoubtedly true. Is that the message we are giving the world? And believe me, as a matter of law, if anybody wants to challenge that these are retrospective, successful or unsuccessful is another matter. But that the retrospective is very clear. In an investment treaty dispute, no arbitrator will be so naive to be fooled by the words for removal of doubts. When the highest interpretation of law in our legal system is the function of the judiciary. When the highest court has spoken, there is no doubt left. What doubts have you removed? Say I have changed my law. Have the courage of your conviction to say, you said my income tax department was wrong. Hell with you. I am changing the law to say my department is right. There is, the message is, we have to empower the tax department. Why? See the change to the Customs Act. They want to make customs offenses on par with offenses under the Narcotics Act, with offenses under the dreaded Prevention of Terrorism Act. If there is a duty dispute of more than 30 lakhs, and that's not a large amount of money, there are people who have walked through Green Channel who have been holed up for duties of more than 30 lakhs. If the duty difference is more than 30 lakhs, and this could include a valuation dispute, your offense is cognizable. It is not only non-bailable, there is a presumption that you have done wrong. The section reads on par with grant of bail in the case of section 302 IPC murder. 30 lakhs of duty equals murder. If you are accused, the department is presumed to be right unless you prove otherwise for grant of bail. And that too to a poor magistrate who has never read the Customs Act in his life before. The time has come where the government has to realize that the citizenry will no longer take this in its stride. This empowerment of the bureaucracy was the hallmark of our leftist leanings, our socialist society. I thought we buried that in 91. The time has come, as Mark Twain said, when men have laws, brutal laws are impossible. When men have voices, brutal laws are impossible. Why have we lost our voice against this brutality? There has been a global outcry. The price for this will be paid by India as a whole, but certainly by the business community directly. The business community in India today is no longer a community which has been fostered by the license control Raj as it was in the 70s and 80s. You are not beholden to those who sit in North Block. Stand up and say you will not stand for this nonsense. Business community shuns politics. This is not a pol question of politics. It's a question of survival of certain basic values in India. It's a question of are we as a citizenry willing to stand by while governments practice cheap populism at the cost of the poorest Indian. I don't think any of the rich Indians will have to sell their private planes or their yachts on account of this. But the high cost economy, the high cost economy because of the cost of taxation which we are imposing will hit the lower middle class and the poorest the most. Why has all this been done? Because we cannot curb our profligacy. There is not a single rollback of subsidies. There is nothing to suggest that there is even an attempt to improve the 70% waste of every rupee we spend on subsidies. Only less than 30% reaches targets, the target uh, beneficiary. Nothing on that score. All that you have is a frontal assault on investment, a frontal assault on Indian growth. India is in a state of churn. This is the time for those 
who want to speak for the country to stand up and be counted. I think the time has come for debates, discussions like this, and for a strong view to be presented by the government. It is unusual. What values do we have? It is now a matter of public knowledge that when in 2007 Gordon Brown wrote to our Prime Minister, saying, are you going to tax an English company retrospectively? He said, the question doesn't arise. The matter is in courts where it will be resolved finally. Is the word of our prime minister worth less than $3 billion to us? Is that what we have come to as a nation? Are we that poor as a nation? I think the time has come for all right-thinking people in India to say, we don't care what happens to Vodafone. We don't care what happens to those affected by transfer pricing. Incidentally, I was in London when the budget provisions were announced. Three solicitors interrupted my meetings and said, sir, one, two minutes, we need an answer, which we know, but we need it from an Indian city council. I said, what? I said, they have amended and said, we will have advanced ruling for transfer pricing, very nice. But can they, by retrospective law, change transfer pricing rulings? I said, of course they can. If they can change Supreme Court, they can change. They said, then what use is it? I said, well, it's good for my profession. You go pay money, get an advance ruling, and then get the law changed. That's the message which we are given. I think the time has come for all right-thinking Indians to stand up for the business community, and this is the business capital of India, to stand up and say, sorry, we will not take this in our stride. We will raise our voices, for I'm sure in all democracies as there is in India, a day will come sooner than later, where the voices of sanity will prevail. Thank you.